Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murders and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road as you came. He sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, this is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem and has come here for the purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, confounded the Jews who dwelled in Damascus, proving that, he is Je- that, that, that this Jesus is the Christ. Verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot came to no- be known to Saul, and they watched the, gate, the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus the the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed among against the Hellenists, but were attempted, um, but they attempted to kill him. But when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's so powerful. Thank you for it revealing all these things that mean so much to us. Uh, and Lord, we, we know that you have plans for these verses for us. So we yield our lives to you, those of us that know you. Lord, we yield our lives to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to learn all the things you want us to learn. Thank you, Jesus, for raising from the dead and thinking of everything that we needed. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Easter is when we formally celebrate the Lord Jesus' resurrection from the dead. It's a day of victory. It's a day of celebration and everything that goes with it and the implications of it. King David wrote in Psalm 16, verse 10, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, this, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ was foretold and fulfilled it's not wishful thinking it wasn't a hoax the disciples didn't make this up they didn't steal the body 
they gave their lives testifying that they saw Jesus raised from the dead. People die for causes all day long in all different parts of the world at different times. They die for something they believe. But but nobody dies for something they know to be false. And the disciples knew whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. They either saw him or they didn't. And they got nothing in return. They got persecution. They got ultimately their deaths testifying that they witnessed Jesus from the dead. And I'm not going to go into all the evidence for the resurrection. That's, that may be another Easter message in the future. Uh, but I want to look at today a changed life and really a case study. A case study at a man who saw the resurrected Christ. And in some ways, his experience and his calling, his life, all those things experience are, of course, very different from ours, this Saul of Tarsus. But in other ways, our lives as Christians followed the same exact path. So Saul of Tarsus, he was transformed in an instant. And he, was, he encountered the risen Lord, and eventually this resulted in him having his name changed, changing his name to Paul. God used him to write most of the New Testament, 13 books out of the New Testament, of the New Testament. He greatly ex- used him to expand the gospel into all over the, the known world at that time. So I want to talk about today, and the title of my message is, A Life Transformed Through the Resurrected Christ. And I want to highlight seven aspects or stages of Paul's experience, which parallel our experience as believers and our journeys from an unbeliever to a believer. And we're not going to go through all the verses, so you can relax. I know it's a lot of verses. We're not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to highlight a few aspects here. But what's important is to know that, that God has provided wisdom for ourselves related to these things in terms of not being thrown off by how this, these, this process works. And he can encourage us. And, and the key to understanding all this and why it's important is to trust the process, to trust what Jesus did on our behalf uh, and trust that this relationship, there is a process and we have to cooperate with this process. So the first aspect of similarity that we look at, we see here is that we're sinful. That's what Paul's pre-Christ condition was. Look with me at verses one and two. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that he found, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Saul is a monster. Saul is someone that is doing great damage to the church. And he hated the way. That's what the early Christians were referred to as the way. And, and that's what they were, they were first referred to for a specific reason, because Jesus claimed to be the way. And he also forced Christians to blaspheme. He writes in his letters, he tore families apart, had no problem with doing any of that, putting them in prison. And he's, and he's, and he's, you know, they're recognizing that there's, there's, um, you know, this experience with the Lord that he has is recognizing the fact that he is, um, he's right in the middle of where, where, where God has him. I mean, it's just, God totally interrupts his life. And so he approved Stephen's stoning and, and he was on his way to Damascus. He had approval from the chief priest to go into the synagogues and arrest people of the way, bring them bound back to the chief priest. And how it parallels us is before we come to know Christ, we're sinners too. Not to that extent in that way, you know, of course, but other ways. And again, the standard is perfection. We measure ourselves against other people, but God measures us against his own nature and his own level of holiness. So the, the fact is, if you're less than perfect morally, you qualify as a sinner. The definition of a sinner is someone that's been less than perfect. So we are still sinful even today. We fall short every day. The standard is perfection. That's not our identity anymore, but that's still a reality that we fall short of perspective, uh, perfection. So people have to come to the point where they're honest with themselves and admit that they're sinners. And usually the disconnect is they may admit that they're a sinner, but they don't connect the reality that that must mean that we need a savior um, if we're sinners. So I love, I love how God reveals all this to, to Saul. The Bible is the only book that tells the truth about man. No other religion tells the truth about man, that we're sinful. 
All the other religions say, and they all can't be true, by the way. Either, either one's true or, or, the, or they're all false, logically. Uh, that's just the reality of how the laws of logic work. So uh, the Bible is the only one that reveals to man that man is sinful and is the only one that reveals the solution, which is God coming in human flesh to die on our behalf because we can never be good enough or religious enough to earn our way to heaven. So we have that in common. We're, sin, we're not to that extent, but we identify with that, that before Christ, before our experience of surrendering our life and being born again, we are sinful. The second aspect of similarity is that we are usually not expecting Jesus to interrupt our lives. We're not expecting that at all. Look at verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So here Jesus absolutely interrupts Saul's life. What do you think Paul or Saul was thinking that morning when he left to go to Damascus? Do you, you think that the, he expected something like this? He was eating his breakfast, you know, as the equivalent to Pop Tarts back then, or I don't know what they ate, or you know, but he's he's waking up for his day, preparing for his day. And he doesn't realize that he's going to meet God. God's going to interrupt his life. Chapter twenty-six, Paul gives another account of this. And he reveals that it was at midday and that the glory of Jesus outshone the, the, the midday sun. It was brighter than the sun. The glory of Jesus, I can't even imagine going through that to be able to see. And you're, you're blinded and it's, that glory is so bright. And, and we're told also in Acts 26 that Jesus in Hebrew said to him, why are you persecuting me? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus was absolutely interrupting Saul's life. It was a wrap on his old life. His old life was over. He would never be the same. He wasn't asking for it. He wasn't thinking it was going to happen. He was just going through what he was about. And God interrupted his life supernaturally. didn't expect it. How many of you here had God interrupt your life when you didn't expect it, when you came to know the Lord? You, it's usually how it happens. Usually you're not expecting it. And God sends somebody that loves you enough to tell you the truth, to tell you the gospel. And there's just these things that happen, these circumstances. I remember for me, in fact, this month, I'm celebrating 34 years of this happening to me. And, and I wasn't blinded I was, you know, by God. And none of these specific things happen, but God uh, interrupted my life as a 20-year-old. And, and by God's grace, I never look back. And, and, and God has transformed my life. But I wasn't expecting anything. I was chasing a girl. It wasn't Sandy, I'm ashamed to say. Although I met Sandy that day, I was chasing a girl. And, I had, and, and she just invited me, and I didn't want to go. And I thought, you know, I'm going to invite her to this other church I'd heard about. She'll say no to that. Then I won't have to go to either. thought I was going to do a little Jedi mind trick on her. And she, to my shock, said, sure, I'll go with you to the church. And I'm like, inside, man. Why did that happen? Why did I think that that was going to work? And so I went. We went to Calvary Chapel Modesto, 1990. And it was great. I heard the gospel. I got loved on, all that. But God had a different plan for me. Because the next Sunday or the two Sundays, I can't remember, you know, I said, okay, you know, we're, I'm good. She goes, no, you're not good. Why don't you come to my church? I'm like, no, I don't want to go. It's a big church. There's, I don't want to meet people. I don't like people. You understand that? Future pastor not liking people. And, you know, and I'm like, you don't understand, you know, and I went there and all the seeds had been planted by my sisters about the gospel. Pastor was screaming, it was annoying me. I didn't listen to anything that he said. And God directly spoke to me and said, you are on your way to destruction. Your life's a mess. You're not on your way to heaven. Everything your sister said is true. And I, and I, I prayed right then in the pew, not even going up, responding into an invitation or anything. And God supernaturally came upon me at that moment. And met me there, and I was transformed. God loves to change lives, and He always makes people are sometimes they're afraid. What's God going to make me into if I surrender to Him? Like like Jesus, going to make you like Jesus? Is that, that is that all that bad? Do we have the character of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the patience of Jesus? All these things, as we get closer and closer to Him, He starts bearing fruit through our lives and changing us from the inside out. So we weren't looking for that. Paul wasn't looking for that. 
that's a, an, an amazing parallel there. Now, the third aspect of similarity here is that Jesus exposes our fight against him. Look at verse 5. And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. First, the obvious thing is how closely Jesus associates with us. That he would say, if you're persecuting my body, you're my people, you're persecuting me. You ever had that in school where there, you know, fights and things and, you know, there's the younger brother and the older brother. And the, basically the older brother says, if you, pick, if you pick a fight with my younger brother, you're picking it with me. You know, obviously way inferior to what this is about, but that's how closely associates with us, which just melts our hearts. But what I want to focus in on is the end of verse 5, where it says, I, um, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. What is a goad? Do you know what a goad is? If I called you up and I said, Jess, I want to borrow a goad. Would you know what that is? Would you have one? It's a small spear. It's a small thing that they would take with oxen. So oxen are plowing. They're not necessarily all that motivated to be plowing all the time. I'm told I've never had an oxen. I've never used an oxen. I don't even have a license to drive an oxen. I don't think you need licenses, but they didn't want to go. And, the, and so the, the, the rancher or the owner of the, of the, um, the, the ox would, would take this small spear and he would hit the, hit the ox so the ox keeps going. And sometimes the ox, to try to get a message over to, to him, would, would kick against it. Would, would resist it. And it would just cause the, the ox to get hurt by fighting against what the owner wanted him to do. And so what's obvious here is that God was guiding Saul a different direction than Saul was going. God was trying to bring him a certain direction. And Saul was fighting against it. How did he fight against it? He was resisting what the Spirit was doing. The Spirit was trying to draw him he was being confronted by people, Stephen for one, uh, and, and, and going into the synagogues, and he'd end up taking Stephen's pattern and going into the synagogue first once he became the Apostle Paul. But he did this in ignorance. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a, per, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. This is important. We can be resisting and fighting God and not even know it, not even be aware of it. Sometimes we have medical situations and we, we have, I want you to picture you being sick. You have these symptoms. Let's say you have, uh, you know, you have goit, I don't know, uh, back pain, you have hemorrhoids. That's a thing. That's real. You know, you have your spleen hurts. I don't know, I can only think I could find my spleen, but there's pain there. And it's my, you know, and you, you have this, these conditions and it's, it's really de de um, debilitating. And you go to the doctor and you explain what you have and he or she is unable to rightly, rightfully connect all the elements with a particular disease. And I, and I would hope in that case there wouldn't be any common denominator. Uh, that's pretty brutal symptoms there. But um, they say they can't bring this and show you and give you the wisdom to show that all these things are connected. So the doctor prescribes a bunch of medications to deal with each of these symptoms and doesn't know there's this root cause, doesn't know that this, this, this is one disease, let's say, that's happening, but you, and the doctor is unaware of it. So the doctor gives you a bunch of prescriptions like they normally do. And let's say this disease is easily treated, but, but you don't know about it. And the doctor's trying to figure it out, and they have no information regarding the solution to it. So often that describes perfectly us before we come to know Christ. Uh, because we can have, because Saul's biggest, biggest, you know, his biggest need in his mind was religious accomplishment, had to have zeal. But God was driving him like an ox somewhere else, and he was fighting against it. So sometimes we can think, before we come to know Christ, we sense these symptoms. We sense potentially addictions. 
anxiety, depression, which can be a physiological you know, thing, of course, um, loneliness, lack of purpose, emptiness, uh, poverty, these things that we're aware that we have need of. And often, we're not understanding that those are just symptoms of something much more foundational and systemic that's wrong. And God uses those things often to get us to be thinking about Him and brings us into humility. Most people, when they're all prideful and they think everything is great, usually don't feel like they have a need for God, though God reveals clearly that they they have a need for Him. All, All of us do. So you, us trying to fix those things, and I've been, been involved with many people over 34 years, this month's 34 years, 34 years of people trying to deal with these symptoms when there's a greater need there. I know it. I've seen it hundreds of times in people. I had these things. And it doesn't mean all your problems go away. I'm not, don't, don't, tell, don't think that for sure. But he either removes these things or gives you the ability and the capacity to, to, to deal with these things and have them be used to make us more like Christ. But just like the doctor I described, the per, we, we, we can be, maybe that's you here today, you're trying everything. You're trying everything that needs to happen in your mind to fix this situation. But there's something so much more deep that's going on. And that is we're separated from God from a relationship with God. And God wants to deal with your primary need. That's a relationship with him, having your sins forgiven and having him put your house back in order how he from the inside out in a way that he desires. And that's 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 a great thing. And so as Christians, sometimes we're 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 there for people we're sharing and we're trying to help people see their greatest need. But people don't see their greatest need often until they have they're, they're ready to, to, to make that commitment to Christ and be able, they're open to it for the first time. Sometimes there's humbling that has to happen uh, to get them to be ready and come like a child in simple faith to Christ and saying, I didn't do a really good job running my life. You know, we can have this God-sized void in our hearts. We try to put these microscopic things in to bring fulfillment and only God can come in and fill that void. And that's, that's, that's a great picture of what God's doing uh, in our lives before we come to know him. Now, the fourth aspect of similarity here is a genuine faith is demonstrated through small steps of obedience. Look with me at verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So notice he says, Lord, right away. Calls him Lord. He was born again at this time wasn't later. It was right here when he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? He does, you know, he, he, we don't know if there's anything else he said or in his heart or whatever. He didn't say, I'm sorry. I I mean, there's all these things that happen in his heart to God. And he says, what do you want me to do? A very healthy response. I love hearing new believers ask that. I love hearing new believers say, you know, what do you, what do I do now? (laughs) How does this all work? You know, I love those questions. Because immediately they sense that their, their lives matter. And, and, and they matter to God and they matter in terms of how God can use them. And, and, and sometimes people are just, it's like they're just shocked that God could use them. I'm still shocked that God can use me after all these years. Because I know myself better than anybody else. And I know that I'm flawed and I know that I'm sinful. But God decides by His grace to use me. And the people that are used the most whether they're new believers or mature believers, don't put any limitation on how God can use them. Anything based on themselves because they know that God's the one that's sufficient to give them and compensate everything that they, that they need. So I, I love it. And, and I, I always tell new believers quickly, just, be, just do the next thing. Do the next thing. It's, it's, I'm amazed on how we can complicate things. He, you know, Jesus told him two things only to do. Arise and, and go into the city. That's it. Nothing more. Not a list of 25 things. Not a list of, we can so complicate it. I call it the basic five. Prayer, read your Bible, go to church, share your faith, and serve. The basic five. And, and the extent to which we engage in those things is the extent to which God will bear fruit through our lives. So he just gave them the next thing. And, we, and that often happens in, in mature believers. 
or we've known the Lord for a while. We don't know. We don't know. He doesn't lay everything out. Very rarely is he laid out like this whole big thing. I think of uh, Philip, you know, where God, he's being used greatly in Samaria. And then God tells him, go to the desert. Doesn't tell him what he would do. Doesn't tell him how long he'd be there. He just says, go to the desert. And when he, he was obedient to that, in, then he sees the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch coming and sees him reading Isaiah and, and ran to the chariot. That's a whole other sermon on following God's will. But it, there's these little intermittent steps that happen that is, is beautiful to, why, to watch. A, a life of faith is a life of dependence upon God, and He gets to do with our lives as, as He sees fit, and it's always good. We don't have to fear what God will lead us to do or be a part of. It's always perfect. He made us a certain way. He knows that. He gave us these desires that we have a lot of times, and of course, we surrender those things to Him, but as we follow Him, sometimes we find out He's made me to be engaged in this ministry or this ministry. And, and, you know, sometimes it's what you expect. Sometimes it's not what you expected. So Saul was blinded and led by the hand in Damascus. He was three days without sight because he was blinded. So he was, he was there. They had to lead him by the hand. Doesn't say he was riding a horse. He could have been, I don't know. I don't know why you're led by the hand if you have a horse. But, you know, we add things to Scripture sometimes, but it doesn't say that. And he's three days without his sight. He didn't eat or drink or anything. That's how serious it was for Saul. He didn't eat or drink nothing. I am waiting. I am waiting. And he's praying. Perfect. He's in the perfect place for God to do the next thing, right? To be there expecting and waiting on God. Then we're told that that God gave this disciple Ananias a vision and told him to go pray for Saul. And lay his hand on him that he might receive his sight. He told Ananias, Saul was already there waiting. He was praying he, he, that, that Saul had been given a vision um, of a man coming named Ananias who would lay his hand on him, just like what Ananias did. And Ananias had a little bit, was doing a little bit of hesitation there, a little bit of quality control. Uh, uh, Lord, you know who this is. I mean, this guy's been doing horrible things to your people. Or you, you know, you better make sure that you have heard from him and he's he's making sure and yes he he must i will show him all the things he must suffer for my, my name sake as 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 a result of it so it's a beautiful picture of of god working together uh people and relationships for specific purposes look at verse 17 this is the result and ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him he said brother saul the lord jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So it happened just as God said it was. God spoke on both ends there. He received his sight at once. Now remember, you know, he was, he was spiritually blind before, and God made him spiritually blind to humble him to show him that now your eyes have been opened. You, were, you thought you could see, but you couldn't see. You were blind spiritually. And I made you blind physically to show you who's really in charge, you know, and there's, there's, there's I mean, I'm sure going through his mind, he's thinking, man, I really, really never want this thing to happen again. And God, and God was so gracious and he had no idea. He didn't know this story. He didn't know this was happening, but God did. And so um, it's a beautiful picture uh, and, and also we see there, um, the end of verse 18, that he was baptized. By the way, we're going to have some baptism soon. We have some new, new believers and some kids and all that. We're going to have a baptism. And, and I love how fast this happened. There was no long, long process and all these things. And I understand about under, helping people understand what, what the purpose of baptism is and all those things. And, you know, we go over that and everything. But there shouldn't be massive, long periods of time in between baptism. This happened right away. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he was water baptized. Verse 19 says, so when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So the fifth aspect or similarity here is God often sends strategic people vital for our new faith. God sent Ananias to Saul. He was vital for what God was doing in Saul's life. And God usually does that for us. Not always, but he usually does that for us. How many of you can think back of a very strategic person 
or people that God put in your life to get to, to help you during those, those new days, those brand new days as a new believer? How many people? Yeah, a lot. I had Tom Brown, a man named Tom Brown. I had Brian Richardson, my youth pastor. I had Garth Adderholt, who spoke from here. Those three men, very, very, very st- strategic in my life that helped me as a brand new believer. It was, it was a beautiful thing what God did in Saul's life here. Um, and, and, and also, so for Saul, he brought not just Ananias, but also he brought Barnabas. Barnabas, Barnabas means son of encouragement. Barnabas would, would later go on missionary journey with, with the Apostle Paul. And, and these were very strategic people that God raised up. So he works, with, with, related to us, he uses the rest of the church at different times to help us, very strategic relationships that he places. So it has a lot of parallels for us. The sixth aspect or similarity is hardship soon follows. <laughs> Boy, don't we know that. Hardship comes right away. There was great growth in Saul. He preached in Damascus boldly. All who heard were amazed. The Jews were confounded by Saul as his, and his ability to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Great, great initial fruit, great start. But then look at verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. So the, this, this many days is, is, is actually a long period of time, but it happened that this, this, the Jews plotted to kill him. Here he was plotting to do all these things and did all these things to believers, but now it's happening to him. That's kind of the evidence that, that, you're, that God's using you. You know, when, when uh, people want to persecute you. Um, and, and Paul was not, was not um, any different. And, and so he escaped, we were told in the passage, but then look at verse 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So <laughs> they like, I don't believe this. This is another trick. He wants to get close to us, and then he's going to arrest us and all these things. It would be like, I know it's completely different, but let's say in Nazi Germany and, and someone, you know, Hitler came and said, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm a newly converted Jew. Um, they would be afraid that this is something that is, is, a, is an act, it's a scheme or whatever. And so, um, you know, we're told that Barnabas saved the day, so to speak. Barnabas testified because he tried to join the other apostles and disciples and they rejected him. They were afraid. And, and, and Barnabas saved the day and brought him to them and validated Saul. Um, but I'm sure it was still hard on him to have that. I mean, I'm sure he wasn't surprised. Didn't like shock him. But, you know, he, I'm sure that probably hurt Saul. The fact that the other leaders and all of that rejected him and... So he dealt with persecution and he dealt with rejection right away. And that's so, so often that's what we experience sometimes by the closest people in our lives after we come to know Christ. The people that we think are going to be happy for us are not happy for us. We can be involved in every crazy thing in the world and they're fine with that. We can believe in aliens. We could believe in you know, all these things. But you say you're a follower of Jesus now, all of a sudden, oh no, there's something wrong here. This is this shouldn't be happening, and 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 all again misunderstanding of what he turns uh, believers into. Believers in turns people into people that love, people that are that that care, that try to help, that are servants. All these things. That's what God wants us to represent, and we don't always do that. We you know again we fall short, but again he wants us to to recognize that he he has these trials for us. They come. You know, Paul had to lift up his heart and his mind and, and trust in what Jesus did for him and to help him and for that grace to be able to withstand all that. So trials come, hardship happens. It's all part of the deal. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, this, Jesus is talking here. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus shooting straight with us. You're going to have tribulation. Again, he said to Ananias, I will show him what he will suffer for my name's sake. But he also said, I'll bring him before kings. I'll, you know, all these things that he, and he did, he did all those things. But there's a difficulty that happens. See, sometimes we, we don't realize that when we don't know the Lord, we're going 
we're going downstream in a big river with very strong current. And when you're in a river, I've almost died doing class five rafting. I'll never do that again. Uh, but you, when you're in a river that's going fast, when you're in the river, you don't realize the current. You know, you don't sense that. You don't see how strong it is. It's only when you turn around and do a U-turn, which, which, which that's what repentance is. We do a U-turn in the road of life. and we, You realize, oh my goodness, this pressure, this this. This uh, current is so strong. We're going into the current of our sinful nature. We're going into the current of the demonic world. Uh, we're going against the current of this world, the way this world is going. Jesus said, if, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If Jesus came today, he would be crucified. The people would reject him. They don't want that message because he tells the truth about man. All the other religions are saying man's basically good and through works, they can accomplish, accomplish whatever it is, eternal you know, life or reincarnation or whatever it is. Christianity is the only one that tells the truth about man, that we're sinners, that we're sinful, we can't save ourselves, that we need God, and without Him, nothing can happen. And, and God has a great plan for us through that. The seventh and final aspect of similarity is Saul was transformed and greatly used by God. Look at verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Remember, verse 1 started with that Saul was still breathing threats and murder. Breathing. (laughs) He's living off of these threats and murder. And and, and that's, that's who he was. But he was transformed. And the effect was that the whole church and the whole region was affected and had peace because they didn't have to be afraid of Paul anymore. Paul was now, you know, if you can't beat him, join him. And God said, Paul, I'm not going to let you beat him, so I'm going to let you join him. You know, and that's, that's what happened. And he, he wasn't this, this person that we end up seeing him be as we look in Scripture. He wasn't. You know, Paul really wasn't a people person. I wasn't a people person. And trust me, I'm no Paul apostle. But... You know, he became this person that was so impacted by love. I love seeing people's hearts be transformed through God's love being applied to their hearts. And it just overflows to other people. Reminds me of the Grinch. You know, Grinch, he had that smile that just kept going up and up and up and up. And that little heart became this big, huge heart. You know, and maybe he ended up being the pastor of Calvary Chapel Whoville. I don't know. But you just think of the transformation. You know, some of you are thinking of that song. Okay, I've watched it many, many times, obviously. No one has ever sung that song or hummed that tune from a pulpit in the world. And I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of it. Don't clap for that. Don't clap for that. But the Apostle Paul, he wrote in the end of Romans in chapter 16. He thanked 26 people by name. Most of them were women. Thank these people by name. At the end of his life in 2 Timothy, he lists 28 people by name. Most of them he's thanking. There's some of them that, were, that, were, that turned out to be bad apples and everything, but he had these relationships. He wasn't this people person before. He was in competition with the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling class. He didn't have these relationships like he did, he was transformed by the love of God. I love seeing new believers be transformed by the love of God. They're, we just walk in this continuous state of having our minds blown by this love of God, that God would come himself and die in our place. That's why it's good news, because he was willing to do that. We need to carry that message. I want to close with this. The visitors, you've done great. Enduring me. I'm glad you're here. Saul was named after, most likely, King Saul. He was the first king in Israel's history, and he was a Benjamite. Saul of Tarsus was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Benjamite. The most famous Benjamite was King Saul, and we're told in Scripture he was a head taller than anyone else and handsome. He was a perfect picture of when we, when we want leaders that God hasn't called, we look at all the wrong things. You know, and David was, the, you know, had, had to 
he re- was re- revealing to everybody by God's calling on his life that God doesn't look at that word of parents. God looks at the heart. Samuel didn't even think that. His, his dad, Jesse, David's father, Jesse, didn't realize that, that David, it was possible for David to be king. So Saul of Tarsus was very prideful, but God humbled him and eventually judged him. So when Paul was sensed the leading by the Lord to, to change his name, he chose his Roman name, which was Paul. You know what Paul means? It means little. It means little. So, if you think you're little, you're in humility, the part, the, have a, having a heart of humility that, that matters to God, a transformed life. You're, you're little in the eyes of yourself. That's what God's working towards. Not big in the eyes of yourself. Not impressed with yourself. We need servants here that serve as an overflow of their relationship and love for God. Not people that are serving because they get a title or because they want to meet some need in their life as, ble- as much of a blessing as serving is. People that are humble. God loves to change and transform lives. And all of this was made possible by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The living Christ is the one who changes lives today and why we are transformed. May we reflect him well. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, would you help us to walk in humility, Lord, and just be honest with who, with, with who we are and let you transform us from the inside out. Lord, I pray for any that are here that don't know you, Lord, help them to see you, who you for who you truly are, not for what, who they've heard you are. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them by your Holy Spirit. Take the scales from their eyes. Help them to see who you really are. Because we know to, to, to know you and, to, lo- and, and to, to have an experience with you is to love you. And to love you is to know you even more. And you manifest yourself to us when we love you by obeying you. So thank you for this message today. Use it for your purposes and your people. Thank you for our changed life that we get to receive. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.